Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Josh and Jason Monday Christian and Conspiracy Podcast Show. I am your host, Josh Monday. If you don't know me, I'm a Christian rapper, devoted husband, father, and armory veteran. I'd like to introduce you to my co-host. He's a Christian, devoted husband, and father. What's up, Jason? Good morning. What's up, everybody? What's up, Jesse? How you doing? Uh, let's get this underway, Josh. Yeah, so we have a, a very special guest. I want to thank uh, Michael Fisher. I appreciate you uh, you know, sending me the information over. Um uh, Jesse Saboter uh, is, is coming on and uh, her, her website is kingdomlivingwithjesse.com. She has uh, three books. His kingdom comes in power. The anointing overflows five minutes of grief with God. And then she also has some amazing classes that you guys need to check out on her website. One of the classes is foundations of kingdom living. The other one is rise of the righteous and beautifully adorned. Jesse, how are you doing today? Great. Yeah. Good to be here. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't butcher any of those. Awesome. You did amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. God is great. All right. So Jesse's going to have an amazing show today. I think um, you, you specialize in a few things. And and um, I think, didn't you have another uh, thing that you wanted to promote? Maybe you have some conference that's going on? Yeah, I have a, I have an event coming up. Uh, it's a beautifully adorned workshop. Uh, basically in that, you know, it's all about coming to that place where we're healing ourselves spiritually, physically. Uh, the healing process is not something really we can do on our own. We can try, but if we really want healing, it's something we need to walk through with the Lord. So we look at, you know, some different tools, techniques that are taught through scripture um, and kind of uh, help you facilitate uh, walking through that healing journey with the Lord. So that's going to be August uh, 10th through the 12th up in Maine. And tickets are available on my website, kingdomlivingwithjesse.com. And uh, also, did you do a a, uh, a conference with, with Gary Wayne as well? I did, yes. So that's awesome. with my uh, show uh, with my co-host, uh, George Iceman. And that's with the Reveal Report. And uh, we were just down in uh, Florida a couple months back with Gary Wayne. And that was amazing. Uh, he is so much better in person. I know it's hard to believe because he's so phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. um, but in person, he just he's got great humor. Um, you know, excellent person to do shows with. So yeah, <laughs> we we we've we had on we've had him on quite a bit. Yeah, a couple of round tables yeah. and everything. So we'll have to have you on for a round table sometime. Maybe a spiritual warfare mm -hmm. one or something, Jesse. If that's yeah, right. that'd be great. But um, yeah, if you want to get into your subject, we would love you to just kind of go and um and, and kind of, uh, I, don't, I don't know which way you want to go with it, but you have a lot of knowledge, you know, I just, I know that you sent me some videos on the military and stuff and I was actually prior military. I think that would be kind of cool to get into. Yeah, absolutely. Um, There's just so much with that. Kind of to give a little background first for people. I want to start with a little bit of my testimony here. Um. The Lord is just so amazing. And, you know, why I start with that is because I want people to see, you know, how the Lord works, that everything he does in our lives is really preparing us for the good works that he's prepared in advance for us to do. So, you know, I was born into a family where neither of my parents were Christian. They they were classified as Christian because they, you know, their families went to church and you know, they would say that they believed in God. Uh, my dad's side was Lutheran and, uh, you know, they were kind of your Sunday, maybe periodically churchgoers, uh, definitely were there every holiday. Uh, but the only thing that they ever religiously did was fish. You know, it was a strong Scandinavian family. The men were hunters and fishers, and that's what they did usually every weekend. Uh, my mom's side were devout Catholics and, you know, went to mass daily and prayed and everything in that side of the family looked, you know, like your perfect, normal, average family. But that was the side that, you know, held held vast secrets that included um, what, what I'm going to call the system, which is the Luciferian Brotherhood. So as the story goes on, um, you know, around age two, God began to move and it started with our house pipes freezing. And when that happened, my parents and I were forced to have to move in with one of my dad's relatives who was a, a strong believer and a Christian. 
And he began to take me and my mother to church. And I can remember my first time there that, you know, I was the only uh, little one in the nursery. And I remember this little Mexican woman named Lily. And she, you know, was not one to water down the gospel or, you know, make it child friendly because I was just two years old. Uh, She literally, you know, sat me down in her lap put the Bible across our laps and started to read to me from the book of John. And I can remember my heart leapt. Um, I was so excited to hear the words out of, you know, John chapter one. And I remember the feeling, you know, like I just, I knew it was true. And I left there, you know, proclaiming to everybody, get ready. Jesus is coming. He's coming. So You know, that first year, um, I ended up getting a lot of, you know, training. Lily would teach me uh, Bible songs, all these little things that went into my toolbox uh, for what was coming next. And, um, you know, that was all that I had, you know, even though it was, um, you know, I'll say not well defined, um, you know, I just had the straight word of God and I had little Bible songs. And at age three, I asked the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart. And, you know, uh, my mom was the first and, um, you know, then came home and she said, would you like to ask Jesus into your heart? And I said, yes. So at age three, I became a little Christian. And uh, at age four and a half, a year and a half later, Uh, my training in the Luciferian Brotherhood occult began. And, um, you know, it was very multifaceted. And I like to describe, you know, this occult as a system because that's what it is. Uh, For all these generations, you know, they try to get away with um, making it look like a multifaceted religious, you know, organizations that are separate, including secret societies, but really it's all, you know, one system. And if anything, you know, you can get off my website and from my testimonies, I speak on multiple shows a week. Um, I really want people to understand how this system works and operates. Now, my family uh, was the top of the system. If you can imagine a triangle, at the very, very top of that triangle, you have the five mothers of darkness. Um, That was who my relatives were. Um, In fact, the relative whose position that I was chosen to be trained for to uh, succeed, uh, she was the queen mother of darkness. And their job in the system is, is pretty much to run the system to ensure that it keeps going. Uh, They choose people for certain positions at the higher levels. Uh, They're also going to make decisions about who's considered a hierarchy child in the system. Uh, That's going to be a child that, you know, is chosen to take a position, whether high or low, uh, that's going to keep that uh, system going. Uh, They'll also decide who's considered an expendable child. Um, that's their word, not mine. I don't believe any child is expendable, but um, for them, expendable children are just those that make money for the system. So, you know, that child's going to be used for sexual exploitation. Um, You know, they're going to be sold ritually um, for cannibalism and other things, ritual killings. Uh, They're going to be made into diamonds and, um, Then their remains after the diamond are going to be uh, sold as filler to our pharmacia or to um, our our food company. So they make a lot of profit off of uh, those that they consider expendable. Um, How does that look? Um, I remember as a child, you know, being taken to the Frank Lloyd Wright houses and it would look like it was going to be a school tour. But, um, you know, we would show up with teachers and uh, helpers for those teachers who usually were the mothers of darkness. Uh, So just these little old ladies. And uh, as we would, um, you know, be standing in lines, 
uh, the mother simply would walk past the rows of children and they would either nod their head, meaning that child was hierarchy, or they would hold up a finger, which told whoever was being the teacher that that was an expendable child. Um, so within just a matter of seconds, just walking past a school line, they would decide the fate of that child. So as we go back to that triangle, underneath the mothers of darkness, you have um, what we call the, the satanic or the druidic council. Uh, that's also known by other names that you may recognize, like the global uh, alliance, the global federation, the world governing council. Um, so they're kind of the CEOs or the board of directors for this system. And, um, you know, their job is to oversee a quadrant, uh, whether that's within the United States or internationally. So they'll be assigned to, you know, north, south, east or west quadrant. And they're going to get the mother's orders that come straight from Lucifer. And then their job is to make sure in their quadrant that those things happen um, and that the system is running like it's supposed to in that quadrant. Um, now, with that satanic council, you also have what's called um, the lower chambers, which is the general council, which consists of about 300 seats. Um, then you also have the, the ch special chambers, uh, which are going to be special councils, um, like the Council of 21, the Council of 13, the Council of 7. So they're going to oversee specific matters within the quadrants that uh, need to be addressed. Um, underneath the Druidic Council, you have um, a group of individuals called the Grand High Priest or Grand High Priestesses. Uh, so these are individuals that, again, they're going to, you know, they're kind of like the department managers, they're going to kind of see the whole organization within the quadrants. You're going to have several of them within a quadrant working together. Uh, usually they're going to have um, a title or be connected to, um, especially if they're male, the Knights of Pythias. Um, these are going to be the ones that will own mansions or uh, be connected to the castles in your area. And uh, their job is going to be to host uh, the special ritual events. Um, they're going to rotate within that quadrant. Uh, so, you know, four times a year, they're required to host the satanic rituals. Um, and again, that's going to rotate among the grand high priests or priestesses in those areas. Um, those four times a year are going to be, you know, Halloween, Christmas and the spring and the fall equinox. Um, they can do more, but those are the four that uh, usually will always be attended. Um, so with that, those grand high priests, they're going to oversee the high priests and priestesses in the area. And those individuals are directly going to be overseeing the five departments uh, that manage the system's assets within a, a region. So we're getting down into the regional rule. Uh, those five departments are going to be the Masons, the Mormons, the Jesuit Catholics, the Satanists, and the Kabbalah. So, you know, they're going to be, those five departments are going to be in charge of programming um, and training the assets. So, you know, for the hierarchy children, uh, there is a set established program in the system. The overall name of that is the Monarch Program. Um, it has different offsets and, you know, each of those departments are only going to have a piece of the program. Uh, they're not going to have the whole program. So they're each, you know, given a piece according to who they're training, what they're training those people for, and, um, you know, what the end goal is for the children that they're in charge of. What 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 goes into choosing the kids? Is there like a, is there like a certain thing about the child or is it 
where the fa- where the child came from, the, what family it came from, or who 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 gave like how these children just come about? Are they are they just taken, or yeah. are they are they taken from places, or are they? No, usually um, it depends. So for uh, for the hierarchy children, they are going to be born within those thirteen in bloodline families you actually have 14 families all together um we know that you know the bloodline families stem from the 12 tribes of israel um the lord gave joseph a double portion uh with both his sons ephraim and uh, manasseh so that's how you get 13 bloodlines but the 14th stems from abraham's uh first son ishmael and that line is kept the purest, and that's known as the Muslim Brotherhood. So um, children are born into one of those families, and then how they're selected is by their spiritual gifts and abilities. And um, some of these children are bred through the systems breeder programs uh, to have you know, certain gifts. Uh, the system is going to be looking for the high-level uh, spiritual gifts uh, like prophecy, you know, apostles, revelations, understanding, knowledge. Um, those are the higher gifts that they're going to look for. And what they want as well is, you know, really what the agenda for the system is, is that, you know, it's never changed since biblical times when um, Lucifer was cast out of heaven because he wanted to be God. So that's still his agenda. It, you know, he wants to get all of the spiritual gates open. He wants to get his um, demonic army that is inhabited in hu- uh, in human hosts uh, through those spiritual gates into heaven. And he believes that he can usurp the throne of God. Um, so that's kind of the agenda. So, you know, the children... Um, as they're selected, the goal in the programming and the training is to connect them to demonic spirit uh, spirits who they're going to host, and they can have more than one, um, you know, and with that demonic connection, uh, both angels, uh, because demons are fallen angels, and humans have spiritual gifts they have things that god created them for they have things that they're able to do things that they specialize in um so you know they're looking at what are those demonic spirits spiritual gifts and when you combine um you know that spirit in a human host it will amplify whatever gifts or abilities um that child has so that's how they make their connections. Okay, quick question. So I heard you say that uh, that demons are fallen angels. I've yes. heard a lot of people say that. So um, I was just asking. Um, so um, some people say they're like disembodied spirits of the Nephilim, stuff like that. Um, that they're that they're and that fallen angels are separate from from demons. So, but I heard a lot of pastors say exactly what you said that that demons are fallen angels. Um, but since you've been kind of through this, uh, maybe maybe you'd have a better understanding of it, because um, that's only in the book of Enoch. The whole, you know, that the mm-hmm. disembodied spirits of the Nephilim are the demons, and then fallen angels are separate. So I, I I study that sometimes, but the thing is, when I when I see like a a fallen angel, and I don't want to switch you off subject because I know it's, but like I've seen angels in the Bible that like one angel could kill one hundred eighty five thousand men, you know. Um, mm-hmm. so that's it, that I, I, we'd have to do, I'd have to have a separate show on that with you because I don't want to get you <laughs> off subject. So if a de- yeah. I feel like if a fallen angel was actually in a human, it's like, I think a demon is like, it seems like they have less power. A fallen angel seems like it would have, you know, I don't know if maybe they, they stripped their Okatarian when they did come down and maybe they lost all that power or I don't, I'm not sure how that works. And we don't know because the Bible doesn't tell us, but I'll, I'll let you keep going. But that's well, a, it does. It does tell us actually, and um, yeah, you know, you tell me that because I, I that's that's an interesting study. Yeah, that, so it, it talks about the fall of you know the fall of the angels, and mm-hmm. you know it tells us that a third um, fell with Lucifer and were cast out. Now, out of that third, it kind of separates into groups where 
it says that some of those were so wicked and evil that the Lord chained them into the lower realms. Mm -hmm. Um, So they're chained there till the day of judgment. Others, which were considered unclean spirits, were allowed to roam. And, you know, when you think about that, you know, the unclean spirits, they attack us um, according to what their unclean nature is. Mm. So the sexual spirits on, you know, that are unclean in the sexual nature are going to tempt and lure with lust. Um, you've got the others that are, um, that are going to tempt you to be prideful. And, and that gets into the seven deadly sins that, you know, they're allowed to tempt according to, um, their sin nature. Uh, so, you know, in that too, we're told in the New Testament that we have the authority to rebuke these evil spirits. Um, nowhere in scripture do we ever see the Nephilim being able to be rebuked uh, because they're considered a, a living being, not just a spirit. Um, so, you know, I challenge that that theory with the Nephilim spirits. Um, I really don't find validity for that i mm-hmm. think that like the fallen ones their fate was sealed the moment you know they don't get the chance for redemption like we do um why because you know scripture says that their heart was continuously evil every inclination of their heart was towards evil and that's why the lord destro- destroyed them by the flood mm-hmm. by the flood water um you know so there, there's a lot. It's a really great discussion. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. That's maybe a, that's when we can do another episode. show on. <laughs> and I so, see you have that's a, I just like love the way you explained it, and and I think it's great. But first, also, I want to yes. say this before we go because we just started going into questions. I want to say, you know, um, you know, I commemorate you for for being able to speak about what you've been through. First of all, and also we want to say, you know, uh, we'll be praying for you, you know, for your, for your healing. I know that it seems like you're, you're, you're really great at, at uh, speaking about this already, but you know, uh, I want to apologize for what you went through. Cause it sounds like you did yeah, go through you. some trauma. So we just want to yeah, say absolutely. that first off before we go and, and also commemorate you for being able to speak about this. And that's all out of love. You know, that that's, that's amazing. So keep going. Yeah, thank and, you. and, and uh, yeah, if you could keep so going, we'll get more into the angelic army here. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is, so, this is, I love, you this know, stuff, that was so. part of my job was to, to work with Lucifer and his army. And, you know, this is probably the easiest way to understand, um, you know, that demonic world is when we think about it as an army. Uh, The book of Ephesians talks about that, where you have principalities, you have authorities, you have, um, you know, spiritual forces, rulers, authorities that are over those spiritual forces. So, you know, that army is broken down you know, I kind of break it down more simpler into, you know, I learned that Satan had generals. Um, I knew that there were nine of them. Um, I do a great land assignment course where I really break this down so you can understand how these demonic generals are operating within your community. But basically, um, if you think of a clock, Um, And this is the easiest way to describe how I learned this. But think of a clock starting up at the 12 o'clock. You have Avedon. Uh, Avedon is also known as Apollon. Uh, He was the demonic general that I knew that interfaced with the U.S. and world militaries. So, you know, their projects, their experiments, their programs. He was the one who oversaw a lot of that. And I'll get into that part of my testimony. But um in a minute here, but that was a huge chunk of, of my abuse within the system was being trafficked and, and spiritually exploited through uh, the military. So it, you go next to about five o'clock, you have Baal. Uh, then at about three o'clock, you have Molech. At uh, four and five o'clock, you have Bephomet. Down at six o'clock, you have Leviathan. And he's the only demonic general that is not bound to jurisdiction or authority over land. Um, his authority and jurisdiction, as scripture says, is over, over water. 
Uh, that includes both the ocean and the seas, as well as any waters or springs that are on the land. And scripture says that, um, you know, first it tells us that the Holy Spirit of God uh, hovers over the surface of the deep. But it also tells us that Leviathan likes to frolic in the surface of the deep. So wherever you have the Holy Spirit moving, um, Leviathan is going to be there uh, trying to, you know, stop, intervene, and and uh, thwart the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, next, you have it about seven, eight o'clock. Um, you have Azazel. Uh, he, unlike the others, uh, he is chained, but not to the lower realm. Scripture tells us that Azazel is chained to the Euphrates River. Um, then at about nine o'clock, you have Toth, and that's T-H-O-T-H. -H. Um, then at about 10 and 11 o'clock, you have Samuel. So those were, um, you know, eight. And then the ninth is right smack dab in the middle. Uh, um, that is going to be Ashtaroth. Now, these nine demonic uh, principalities, you know, their job is to you know, rule, um, I wouldn't even necessarily say it's broken up by quadrant. Um, you know, they are assigned certain areas and territories. And, um, but within that, you know, there's always infighting. So they will make alliances with people. Um, you know, thus they try to gain more power and authority and jurisdiction within their areas. Um, each of them has commanders that rule underneath them. I don't encourage people to read this book, but you can certainly look into it on, um, you know, online on Wikipedia and, and learn a little bit more. But um, these nine principalities were the ones that King Solomon uh, learned to summon and work with. And um, as he did, he mapped out all of these principalities, uh, their commanding structure and, um, you know, their jurisdiction and authority. Uh, you can find all 72 of those uh, principalities and commanders names in his book, uh, The Keys of Solomon. But again, I don't encourage you to read that because, you know, it's basically a book about summoning these spirits. So, um, but the knowledge was there. It was something that King Solomon sought out himself. And, um, you know, that was kind of King Solomon is considered kind of the founder or, you know, the one who kind of put an organization structure to the Luciferian Brotherhood. Um, it does go all the way back to Canaanite times uh, to before um, the time that God called Abraham to come out of the land of Ur. So, you know, you can look back into the, that ancient history and culture, and you're going to see the sorcery, the witchcraft, the divination. And who was it who taught that to these men and women uh, who became the brotherhood? Really, it was the fallen angels. And in Genesis 6, it tells us that you know, as the fallen angels came down and, and uh, you know, created offspring with the women of men, that they taught those women all sorts of forms of witchcraft, divination, and sorcery. Uh, so that's where it stems from, the hidden knowledge of, of these fallen angels. Uh, so um, before I go on, I'll pause for some questions. Yes. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. There's so much information <laughs> packed in all that stuff you said. So, um, can these, do you believe that? Well, let me ask you, cause you probably would know, can Satan come down in the form of a human and speak to these people? Like, uh, like, you know, since I know the angels can usually, uh, when they come down, they have a form of a human, you know, or a human body. Uh, do you, do you believe Satan can do that? That's first question. And are the nine generals, are those coming down in the form of human as well? Or are this just all spiritual? I, it, it is both. Um, you do have uh, Lucifer, Satan taking on different forms. Uh, I witnessed him take on four different forms uh, in my childhood times. Um, you know, one of them is a very, as scripture says, he's very alluring, very beautiful. Uh, so that's, you know, 
if he takes a human form, usually it is that form as the very alluring, beautiful man. Um, he's got one where he looks golden and blonde, but he has another where he looks darker, um, you know, with dark hair and stuff. Then in, in that one, too, he also has a shadow form, uh, which is the easiest way to kind of describe it, where he just it looks human, but it looks like a shadow and looks like he's got some scaly armor on. And then he has his dragon form, um, which is just this massive dragon that he mm. appears as. Now, with the generals, um, I did witness some of them in physical form as well. Um, you know, my experience, I had ones like uh, Ball and Molek, who appeared more as standing bull-type like creatures um you know toth was more like an ogre i i guess that's the best way to describe him kind of this big bulky ogre very big um astaroth uh my experience of her was you know and that was one that they tried to link and connect me to um that ritual happened at nurschwanstein in germany at the castle there and um you know, as they brought her through the summoning circle, she looked like this, you know, thin female mummy with hanging flesh. Mm. And she crawls super fast. And I was just like, oh, heck no. <laughs> you know, it's like, and the only tool now, and I want people to remember this because so many people are afraid of spiritual warfare. You know, they they say, oh, well, we can cast out demons, but that's only the little I call them the little chicken demons because when you get the unclean spirits, you usually get them in hordes like chickens and they will all flock around you and oppress and hoard you until you fall into sin. Um, you know, and people think they can only, you know, cast out those spirits. But, you know, as a child, when Asheroth came at me, the only tool I had at that time that I could even think of was my little Bible songs. And I, I stood up in that summoning circle and I began to stomp, you know, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. And with that song, she had to go back down into the ground and could not harm me in any way. So if as a child, if I could take on one of the major principalities with a Bible song, Think about the authority that God has given us as adults. And really, that's the authority that I long to, you know, teach people how to use. And that's what all of my courses, my books are about, is walking and living in that authority that Jesus Christ has secured for us, um, you know, by his death and his resurrection. Wow, that's awesome. And then uh, I was going to ask you. Uh, so which side of the family was the, uh, was it both sides of your family or like, cause you said that, uh, I know you said that one side was Catholic, one side was Lutheran. Um, so was it your father and mother, both that were involved? Both in the active side was my mother's side. That, the Catholic um, side. Mm, interesting. Yeah. But generationally the bloodline I did find goes into my father's side as well. Okay. So, so we had that. And then uh, you said the Masons, the Mormons, the Jesuits. There was two more I didn't get. And I could probably. Uh, the, I could... the Satanists and the Kabbalah. Okay. All right. And then Kabbalah. I'm just kind of writing notes as we go. So, I mean, obviously I could re-listen to the episode. It's my episode, but <laughs> <laughs> I just like to have that because that's, that's very interesting. So uh, was your mom, uh, was your mom part of the five mothers of darkness or is it? Nope, it skipped a generation. So okay. my mother had gone through a lot of the ritual abuse like I did. Um, but it was, yeah, it was another female relative and, and several other female relatives who were the mothers of darkness. And then you said 300 seats. Is that the Council of 300 or Committee of 300? Sorry, is that who that is? Correct. Okay. Yes. Okay, I saw that. Um, the Knights of Pythians. That's pretty interesting. So, uh, Pythias. Pythias, okay. Or Pythias, yeah. Wow. Uh, is with Or us, Pythias with a U. The Mothers of Darkness? I think it's A. Is... I think it's an A, actually, Pythias. We'll have to look into how to start. Are five females at the top? 
the Mothers of Darkness, or is that just the name of the organization? Is it? Nope. Actually... Uh, they are five females. Yes. Wow! At the very top of the pyramid for the for the power. Wow. Correct. Very interesting. All right. Then we got the Druidic Council, and then uh, that's the fourteen families. Is the Druidic Council? That that's fourteen um, families, or, or it's is it made. Council? You have the fourteen bloodlines that are represented through that. Okay, but okay. it it's more than just um, fourteen you know, families. It's more. You said. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And are these like black nobility families? Are these like? Uh, you do uh, have the black nobility represented. Yes. Okay. Um. Do do you can you name any of the names of the families? Or are they hidden? Uh, most are most are hidden, but you can look into uh, special groups like the Bilderbergs. Okay, uh, they're part of that council. Um, you have the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers. Okay, um, you know even Common Day. Uh, you have you know current Rothschilds who sit in that council. Uh, you had the Clintons who sat in that council. Uh, you have. Uh, Obama, who is uh, currently he's taken George Soros's position. Uh -huh. um, Soros, up until uh, May of 2021, uh, was the phoenix of the council. That's like the top uh, position for the lower chambers. Um, so Soros uh, sat in that seat and was the phoenix of the council. Um, and currently Obama is the Phoenix of the council. Yeah. I see George Soros's son took over. Like, it looks like, uh, George Soros is getting, it looks like he might be experiencing some health issues or something, but yeah. I see that. Wow. Very interesting. Okay. Uh, I just had, let me see. So we got committee of 300 and then the nights, and then you said they work on uh, Halloween, Christmas, spring and summer equinox. Very interesting. Uh, a lot of people don't know that Christmas is such a pagan holiday, right? Yeah, I encourage people, there's a great resource called openscrollcalendar.com and you can backslash satanic holidays and it outlines um, basically all of their holidays and um, what is required as the sacrifices. So whether that's animal or human, uh, it also will show you the sexual exploitation. Like, are they, you know, doing their, um sexual things uh their black magic is that with um females is it with males it also will tell you each month when they do abductions um now abductions is not the sole way that they uh procure sacrifices but it's just one of the ways so you know that's usually the time where abductions begin uh where they're holding people for sacrifice and, uh, you know, that's something in my land assignment coaching that we begin to break down, you know, how the cities are laid out according to the brotherhood system. And that helps us to be, uh, be able to identify places that may be ritual ground or even holding ground um, in your area when rituals come through. Oh, very interesting. Okay. And uh, I saw the, the nine generals that you had. Um, th those are all fallen angels, the nine generals? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And um, all right. Well, you can keep going now. I think that's about all I had for that. For that, Jason, do you have any questions, bro? No, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just listening. I'm, I'm gonna... <laughs> yeah. All right. Very interesting so, stuff. Yeah. So my job was to learn how the entire system worked. Um. You know, my training was not just uh, through the Luciferian Brotherhood. It began to, you know, uh, be expanded into, um, I'll say, you know, U.S. military and, and uh, foreign government training, where um, with that, um, I was put through certain training that was connected through the U.S. military. Uh, my main teacher in that in the system was a Nazi by the name of Michael Carcock and from my understanding he is the one of the individuals who specialized in operating the spiritual gates uh, what are spiritual gates the bible talks about those it beginning in the book of Genesis it talk, talks about how God created the earth how he made uh, fountains 
that were above the earth and fountains that were below the earth. Um, those fountains held water until uh, the flood in Genesis 6, and that's when their water was released. And from that point on, that was when those spiritual gates began to be used um, by individuals to, you know, as a doorway between the earth and passing into spiritual dimensions. Um, so how I describe kind of those spiritual dimensions, it's easy as if you think of like a chess, like a five layer chess board where you have that middle layer is going to be earth. Then you have two realms above, which are the heavenly realms and two realms below, which are the lower realms. Now, there's certainly more than that, but we're kind of just going for the basic understanding here. So what happens is that, you know, between those heavenly dimensions and we've talked about, you know, what what's in those lower realms? Well, at that lowest realm, that's where, you know, the demonic angels that were so horrific, they were chained down there. Um, you know, is that hell? Not particularly. You know, it literally is its own place and space and time that God created as a holding place until these angelic beings are judged for their sin and their rebellion against God. Up in the higher realms, you have, you know, what's known as, as I'll just say like, you know, kind of like the outer heavenly realm, which is going to be more like space. Um, and then you have heaven itself, which is God's kingdom which is a very vast kingdom. Um, I love reading the scriptures on it. Uh, you know, it talks about how heaven has pasture lands, uh, how the Lord has a thousand cattle on a thousand hills up there. Um, you know, you've got this vast kingdom. You also have his, you know, his house and his courts. And everything that, you know, we see in scripture, God told Moses uh, was a replica of what's in heaven. So, you know, we have God's temple uh, where, you know, he's worshiped. We also have his courts uh, where he sits and judges the earth and, and the people on the earth, as well as these uh, fallen angels. So um, that's what you have in the higher realms. Now, how the spiritual gates operate, I really get into a lot of detail um, into all of this in my course, the foundations of kingdom living. So I break down exactly, you know, what is the kingdom of God? What does it look like? What is the enemy's kingdom? What does that look like? How do they use these spiritual gates? Um, you know, from my understanding, you've, you've got kind of three tiers of spiritual gates. You have what I call uh, the major or the large gates. Uh, you have seven of those. They are connected to the seven continents, and those are the biggest ones, and they work um, vertically, uh, where, you know, you're able to go into the, use them to go into the heavenly realms. You're also able to go into the lower realms with them. Uh, the other spiritual gates, which are the middle ones and the smaller ones, those tend to operate horizontally, meaning that they're going to take you from a point A to a point B. Now you can have multiple, you know, you could have point A is the spiritual gate and that gate could go to B, it could go to point C, it could go to point D. Uh, so you can have many different uh, places you can go through that. Um you know, probably the easiest way to understand that is, you know, when you look at ley lines and how ley lines, you know, can transfer around the earth, um, that really is kind of how those gates look. They are made of energy. Um, you know, how do they function? Uh, they function off of frequency uh, resonance, which is light. and vibration. So um, each of those gates, you know, as we get into the technical terms that I break down really well in the course, um, really they operate off of song. So each gate is tuned to a different song 
So if you want to operate the gate, you have to know the song and be able to um, come into a tuning with that gate. And then you're able just to pass through it. Uh, people can describe that experience differently. Um, and it kind of is based on training. Like, you know, so in the courses, um, you know, I begin to get into, you know, how the system trains people to interface with those spiritual gates. Uh, you have, you know, the military calls it remote viewing. Um, that happens two different ways. Uh, the first way is the most common, uh, which is uh, that you remote view by astral projection, which means that your spirit separates from your physical body. And so your physical body would remain one place while your spiritual body travels through the spirit world. Uh, that's the most common way that the occult teaches, um, you know, traveling through the spiritual realms. But that was not me. Um, that was not how God created me. So the second form of remote viewing happens more like in a vision. Um, you know, your spirit never separates from your physical body. Physically, you can go into the spirit world. Um, so, you know, you'll see things, which means you could be one place physically, but then in a vision, you're also seeing everything that's happening in another space or dimension or place or time. So, um, you know, that's probably the fast version of, of where we're going. Mm. So um, Michael Carcock was, you know, that was his job after World War II. Um, he was the Legion, Ukrainian Legion of Defense leader for Adolf Hitler. Uh, from my understanding, he and a bunch of other Nazi scientists and uh, spiritual warriors came into the United States. Uh, he worked to set up the Luciferian Brotherhood uh, within um, our governmental structure. Um, it, the two people that he trained uh, was one, Michael Aquino, uh, who was a colonel with the U.S. military. Uh, for the Department of Defense, the Temple of Set, uh, yeah, Temple. Yep. We did a, we did a. Uh, I don't know if you remember, Jason. We did a, a show on that gentleman. Yeah. Yeah. So Michael Aquino was in charge of all the Brotherhood programs uh, and training that were operating through the Western quadrants, uh, both internationally as well as in the United States. And the second person he trained was John Brennan, uh, the head of our Central Intelligence. Um, his job was to be in charge of all the programs that were run for the Eastern Quadrants. Um, so, you know, those individuals then began to do uh, my training within the military. Um, it also included several of, I'll say, a couple other children. So one of the children, I'll just call him my training partner, was a little boy my age. Uh, he was Michael Carcock's grandson. And he was uh, the main person assigned to me as my protector in the system. Uh, Michael Carcock's specialty was defense magic. And I believe really he headed up, you know, the Brotherhood Protector programs, which is why, you know, he uh, came and taught what his specialty was here in the United States, uh, which included defense magic and um, operating the spiritual gates. So um, another child is, I guess you had several other children. So, you know, my circle groups is what they would be called uh, started where there were, you know, we had a circle, a larger circle group of about five children. Um, and then we had a smaller one, which consisted of three. Now with that one of three, we started in our first uh program or project, which was the looking glass. So with the looking glass, um, you know, you interface with the spiritual gates, you begin to learn how they work, how they operate, you begin to listen um, for, you know, their songs and be able to identify, you know, how to open each gate. Um, 
in that also you're going to uh, be using your spiritual gift of seeing uh, through visions and revelations and you know you're going to interface with the spirit world and and you're going to receive visions and uh, see things and so after you know each um, segment or episode of that uh, they would have scientists that would um, take what is called biofeedback where they're going to ask you questions they're going to write down everything you know according to your spiritual senses what did you see what did you hear what did you feel what did you taste um, you know what was said what happened um, so they begin to write down and document everything that these children are experiencing in the spirit world. Now, what's interesting, though, is that all three children perceive differently and they choose your groups based on this perception. So one child will always see the end picture, meaning that, you know, they're going to have visions of end time events things that are going to unfold that haven't yet happened. Um, the next child is going to just see step by step, like they're not going to get the end picture, but they're going to see steps that lead up to that end picture. The third child is going to see steps that lead up to that end picture, but they're also going to see the consequences that come with those steps. So in that, they kind of use that as a threefold confirmation, you know, where when they know what the end time event is and they know the steps that are going to get there and the consequences that go with each step, this is where they begin to try to manipulate time. You know, where do they need to step in? Where does something different need to happen so that if they don't want that end time event to you know, unfold, where, what can they do so that it's maybe changed? So that's their whole purpose in um, using the children in these projects is so that they can try to control time. Um, now in this, what's interesting is that, um, you know, in all the years that they've been doing this, and I believe really it started back around the early 1960s. Um, so you have kind of the several generations from the 60s through, you know, past my time through current day where they've been doing this documentation. Um, what's interesting is that everything stops. Uh, none of the children have ever seen beyond the year 2024. Uh, which is why the system believes that that is when, you know, the Lord is going to come because they're not allowed to manipulate time or change events or seasons beyond 2024. And that is when, you know, the book of Revelations fully starts to unfold. And, um, you know, they cannot change the hand of God. What God has already said will happen in those last days. So um, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So after we went through, let's pause there before I go into the next projects. Uh, okay. If you guys had any questions. So you, you were saying that uh, after the flood. So uh, during the flood, they said that uh, God said that uh, the heavens were open, then uh, the fountains of the deep. And then also it said it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. And then he said he closed the heavens. Now, I don't want to get into too much craziness, but um, so he closed the, the, is that what you're talking about? Like when the heavens were open, that those, those are uh, portals? Yes. And that originally they held water, so they released the water. So okay. now they're just, um, they are currently closed, Yeah, but they can be opened and closed. Okay. That, that's, I was curious about that. Um, all right. And then, uh. There was so much there that you were packed in. <laughs> so uh, the whole time, are you saved when this is going on? Because you. Yeah, I was saved at age three. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So the whole time you were saved. So they were trying to do stuff to you and have you do stuff that. that yeah, you I had were, to you participate in the name of Jesus. Kind and... of. How, how old were you at this when, when this was happening? Like this is just. My you... training started at age four and a half and uh -huh. went through age 10. Okay. By age oh. 10, I was fully trained to step into my position within the system as a mother of darkness. 
Wow. Wow. Okay. Um, Yeah. yeah, So, all right. And then uh, you can keep going. Jason, do you have any questions? Uh, This is, this is interesting. I'm just, I'm listening to you go on. (laughs) Me too. Okay, go ahead, so Justin. so the next uh, project or program was called um, it, the first one you had looking glass. Yeah. The second one were the Star Wars uh, now projects, which were under the original Stargate projects. So with that, um, we were aligned with U.S. military generals who began to, um, you know, not only did we we already knew how to you know, kind of work the gates, but they begin to teach us how to use the gates uh, for travel um, into the spirit world. Also, you know, different operational things that were related to the Department of Defense. Uh, So we began to, um, you know, really uh, become operational with those spiritual gates. Um, The third project then is the Voice of God project. And that one focused also on the operational aspects of utilizing those spiritual gates dimensions um, for the Department of Defense and for um, the intelligence communities. So, um, you know, pretty big projects that people can begin to look into. I really, you know, again, the foundation of Kingdom Living course, I break down and really begin to show you exactly how those work. Um, Now in that, you know, there was a lot of intense things in that training. Um, The most important thing that I bring out is, is the fact that we have our U S military working with foreign militaries and governments uh, to basically weaponize children. And, you know, what are they what, how are they making the weapons? You know, basically it's creating children that operate at the spiritual level that can direct energy. Um, you know, so the biggest day, I, I guess I'll just call it, uh, for the Voice of God project was April 24th, uh, 1984. And in that project, they had a huge weapons display where, you know, many world leaders came. Uh, They were seeing, you know, what can these children do uh, with energy and how can they manipulate it? How can it be used as a weapon? And then they were buying, selling and trading children based on those abilities and those gifts. So I was part of that weapons display. Um, it included world leaders like Reagan. Uh, you had Gorbachev. You had others who were there from Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, um, all bidding, buying, selling, and trading on children. Wow. So I would propose that this is really, you know, the things that we see happening. It's it's not about nuclear. It It's not about, um, you know, something outside of, children it's you know what is the nuclear program i would propose that it has to do with children and it has to do with the those children's ability to access the spiritual gates and pull energy and use that energy as a weapon um so uh we'll stop there if you have further questions um no you can keep do you feel like well is the is the new world order like all working together like some of these wars that we're seeing are they just staged and and just happening just uh to to make it seem like they're just like going against each other it sounds like you said yeah. all the world leaders got together in 1984 that they're all getting together they all have one plan and that they're all working towards and it's not really like everybody's really beefing like they say or what do you think right you do you do have actual war but um you have two sides within the system you have the dark side and you have the light side. Um, the dark side is almost all the way taken down. You're still going to have some members. And what classifies them as dark, it's the type of magic um, that, they, that they're that they trained in. Um, you know, it's that dark, solomonic magic. Um, you know, they also will use blood sacrifice uh, in their rituals. Uh, to accomplish uh, the end goals. So those are things that make it dark. Um, 
everybody within the system as you, you know, go through that training, um, you know, at the basic levels, you're going to, you know, learn the generalities of magic, and then you have to specialize. So you either specialize in dark, light, or gray, which means you're going to be a master of both. Um, you know, as, as you go through that, then, you know, I would say that's going to kind of premise which orders in the system you're connected to, which secret societies, because you have secret societies that specialize in dark versus light. So like order of the golden dawn, they're going to focus more on the light dark. or white light. energy, oh, yeah, okay. more lighter or, or white energy, um, which, you know, they're going to get into the healing, the Reiki, um, oh, you know, different things like that, uh, more of the new age, higher enlightenment type stuff um, versus the dark side, you know, where uh, like Temple of Set, where, yeah. you know, they're or going OTO? to use. What do you think, though? OTO, as OTO well? is Order of the Golden Dawn. Oh, they're part of it. Yeah, yeah. I remember we, we did a show. Yeah, on Order. Too. Okay. Or Temple Orientis, which is Golden Dawn. Okay. Um, so as they begin to pick their specialty orders, um, you know, at the top you, of the system, you have three primary orders, which, um, you know, the highest members are e going to be a part of. So either you're part of the Order of the Phoenix, uh, which Obama is part of that as the Phoenix of the Council. He's also part of the Order of the phoenix and then you have the order of the golden dawn and then at the very top you have the order of melchizedek um it's mm. you know not the true priesthood uh but that's you know Mormon, what does satan that's... do he takes everything and and wants to twist and mock it um you know so you've got the false order of melchizedek um which you know, I'm part of all three of those orders, but primarily Golden Dawn and Order of Melchizedek is what I was classified as as a child. So, um, yeah, so if you want to know more, this is a safe book to read, meaning it's just a, a reflection book in the system. So you're not going to have any demonic connections to it, but a good book so you can understand what they believe um is called the initiates of the flame by okay. manly p hall oh, yeah. and um and in that he he really breaks down the order of melchizedek and what you know that priesthood looks like within the system he also gives signifiers uh so one of them he talks about how all the women um you know men they're required to wear um purple is the color that they're recognized by and they'll be distinguished by pearls. So think, go back, you know, especially through presidential inaugurations, which are rituals and look at the women, you know, what are the women wearing? Um, most of the time you will see purple and you'll see pearls. Why are they wearing that? You know, is it just because every presidential woman wears that? No. It's to signify that they are members of the order of Melchizedek, uh, the fake priesthood. I noticed that Mormons, uh, that's that's what they they're shooting for is the is the the priesthood of Melchizedek, right? Is yes. That, and that and they also, I think, uh, I'm trying to see because we just did a show on that. Um, do they also wear purple? Don't they wear purple uh, garments or is or no, I'm sorry, robes basically? I, I can't remember what they're yeah. called. Wow. Okay. Maybe that has obviously that does that have something to do with it. Yeah, it does. Yeah, because I see that you know you mentioned that it was Masons, Mormons, Jesuits, Satanists, and Kabbalists. So. Yep. Okay. Wow. Very interesting. How uh, you can keep going? We have about another twenty minutes before we 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 okay. end. So. Yeah. So um, again, that that book is uh, you know it will really kind of give you some cores about what they believe and. Um, even in there, you know, if anybody has questions about, you know, are Masons or Mormons Luciferians, do they really worship Lucifer or Satan? Um, that book proves that they do. Um, I believe it's page 69 of all pages. 
uh, where it talks about Lucifer's fall from heaven. It talks about, you know, who they classify as God. They will always call him God, the almighty God, the all clandestine God who blows the wind into the hearts of men, uh, which is actually Toth. Uh, but they, as they go through their rituals and their um, ceremonies where they're rising up in power, uh, you get a series where, you know, they, the higher ups in the system, as you are elevated in your degrees, they'll begin to whisper into your ear uh, the name of God. And, you know, this is all meant to be kept secret and stuff, but we're just going to let it out. Um, so the first name that they're going to hear whispered in their ear is Hamef Horhash, who's one of the demonic commanders. Um, the second one they're going to hear is Toth. Uh, who they claim is the God who blows the wind into the hearts of men. Um, you can look up, you know, approved Masonic meditations to Toth. Uh, you'll see that. You can also look up um, tarot cards of Toth and you'll find those. Um, and then as you get to that page 69, who does it say is, is God? It literally says Lucifer is God. You know, so why is Manly P. Hall, who's supposedly a Christian Mason, um, who also teaches sex magic, you can look up his talk on black, gray, and white sex magic. Um, why is he, you know, calling Lucifer God? Well, it's because that's who is their God. You know, they're not worshiping Jesus Christ like we do. Um they are elevating Lucifer as their God. So um, if you have any doubts, you can see it right there in their own materials. I encourage you to read Manly P. Hall's books because, and listen to his audios, because in that, um, you know, you will see that they, they worship Lucifer, that they are part of this brotherhood system. You'll hear them use those terms about brotherhood. You know, they're not talking about just two men or two women who are in this sibling-like relationship, you know, or, or deep friendship, they will take scripture and twist it and, you know, make it seem like it's all about this brotherhood relationship. But really, what are they elevating? They're elevating the great white brotherhood, um, which is what the true name of the system is called, um, the Luciferian brotherhood. So, um, yeah, so that's all good stuff. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of information. So when did you get out of the uh when did you get out of all this? Was that when you were 10, you said 10 and a half? That's yep, when you kinda... I got out at age 10. How and did you get out? Yeah, literally that was a miracle and act of God. Thank you. Um, yeah. Now, first I have to say that according to the system, you're never out. Like they'll they'll fight to keep you the entire time. So um, you know, technically I'm still considered in on their side, but you know, what happened at age 10 was that we were at a family funeral and, um, literally as I walked away from the grave and walked to the car, the Lord said to me, I have really, you know, released you from them. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, it was like a wedge went down in the spirit, um, between them and me. And, you know, they no longer had power, control, or authority over me. The Lord, you know, gave me that full power and control uh, to literally walk away and to be able to say no. Um, so that was how I got out at age 10. Oh. And it didn't mean that I didn't have warfare or major battles afterwards. I did. Um, I went through a period of time. Uh, we actually lived not far from a witch's grove. Um, so, you know, when I got out, I would have, you know, witches that would be attacking at night, um, you know, trying to pull me back in, trying to pull me into certain rituals. Jeez. And, uh, you know, the, the real spiritual warfare began at age 10. And during that time, you know, I didn't have, I didn't have Christians that I could talk to about my childhood um, up until that point, any time I tried to break the silence, um, you know, even with whether it was a pastor, a teacher, 
you know, I would just get very few words out. Usually it was a sentence like my family is in the occult or, you know, my family kills babies. And Jeez. immediately I would be shut off. Like they wouldn't even ask, oh my gosh, like, what are you saying, kid? Are you okay? Like, you know, do we need to contact the police? I didn't get anything like that. I mean, immediately they would say things like, okay, stop lying, you know, get real. And this would come from pastors who preach that there was a devil, that there was spiritual warfare. So I had nobody to talk to. And the Lord, in his amazing way of working, simply gave me a church library. And one of the first books I found in that library was Corey Ten Boom's book. Uh, she was, uh, you know, a Dutch Christian who had helped to hide Jews during World War II. And her and her family were put into the concentration camps because they were hiding Jews. And after when she got out, she traveled the world preaching the gospel. So she was one of the people that the Lord used her books to to really teach me about spiritual warfare. And then that library was filled with missionary books. So books by Isabel Kahn, Isabel and John Kahn, um, Elizabeth Elliot, whose husband uh, was killed in the Amazon uh, with, his, with the other men who went with him. Um, so all these missionaries the Lord used to raise me up and teach me um, how to overcome yet also how to live. How do I live out my Christian faith? So. Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you're out now. There's a lot of, uh, man, there's so much information that you have from, uh, you know, as far as the pyramid of power and stuff, I, I haven't heard of, I've never heard of some of these things, you know, I've heard of a lot of them, but not, not like the motherhood of darkness and Knights of, uh, Pythias, which I'll have to look up. Pythias, yeah. Pythias, yeah. There's a lot of stuff that you came out with that was very amazing. We appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, uh, any last words for our audience? Like what, like maybe somebody's kind of like has one foot in the occult, one foot out. Maybe someone has their, their whole, you know, maybe they're just fully committed to the occult. Maybe some people are just Christians that are having spiritual warfare. Can you give us some advice on, on how to get out of that and, and how, how the, you know, what prayers they could do or whatever they could do to get out of that? Yeah, absolutely. I encourage people to access the Kingdom Living with Jesse.com. I have tons of material on there, um, including, you know, previous shows that I've done. Uh, George and I on the Reveal Report, we've done a lot of shows that, um, you know, our specialty, both of us came out of the occult at very high levels. Um, and so we talk about that. How do you get out? How do you deal with, you know, demonic warfare? Um, you know, what can you do? So we we talk about all those things, you know, about how you can anoint, how you can rebuke, uh, how you can stand in your authority. Another great uh, session you could do or coaching is uh, the land assignment coachings, which are you can sign up for those on uh, the Kingdom Living with Jesse dot com. Um, in those that they're broken into two sessions, the first one uh, we really look at, like you know. How do you begin to understand how the brotherhood is working in your area? So we look at the city sigils and from those sigils, I tell you how to um, decipher which principalities are considered to have authority over your area, as well as which brotherhood groups are operating in your area. We actually will take some examples and we start to I show you how to research, how to look into, how to find out exactly where they're at. Uh, but it's not meant to cause fear. It's not meant to only be used for prayer. Um, you know, my heart is exactly that, that, you know, if God has brought us out of the darkness, whatever that was in our lives, you know, really, he's giving us the authority to speak into the lives of these people who are bound in darkness. So um, we encourage, you know, people connecting, getting to know those who are working in your communities We've been seeing outright miracles happening, um, you know, individuals who are coming out of the system. So um, I encourage you to look into those land assignments. The second one is going to focus on, you know, now that you know how to get the information, now that you, you know, have this bulk of information, what do you do with it? How do you uh, create 
that and take that information and make it into strategic prayer strategy um, of intercession for your area. How do you begin to tear down the strongholds of wickedness in your area and build up um, places for the Lord? So we break down all of those things. And, you know, again, the major, you know, the, the more expanded version in depth you're going to find in my courses, Foundations of Kingdom Living, The Rise of the Righteous, and Beautifully Adorned, uh, which Beautifully Adorned has not come out quite yet, but they'll come out soon. All right. And Jason, any last words, brother? Thank you for coming on. Thank you for all this information. Thank you. It was, uh, it was wonderful to have you on. Thank you. Yeah, and I th- I would say uh, for the pastors out there, or for some of the people, you're you're, you're they they kind of they don't really expand enough on this type of stuff, you know, on spiritual warfare, or expand on the fact that there's demons, you know, fallen angels. Uh, mm-hmm. They kind of you know they they concentrate on certain areas, you know, just and and I think that maybe they need to open up a little more so that you know people understand how to uh, combat this type of stuff. Now, if you want to go to her website, um, KingdomLivingWithJesse.com. Uh, it seems like, you know, she expands more on that type of stuff. Or if you want to check out some of the shows that she's been on or her, her, is it a podcast, the revive, the one that you're talking about? Uh, um, yeah, that's a weekly, I have several shows that I'm on weekly, which are the yeah. reveal report. Reveal also, report. <laughs> you can access those through my website. Um, and then we have shows, uh, weekly on my website as well. Uh, riding the storms and rise up are the two shows, which are Sunday and Wednesday evenings. And they're all about equipping, yeah. um, you know, a little bit different focus on the two shows. Um, and then we also have my ministry, Illuminate the Darkness, where, you know, in this, um, the Lord's brought me to the place where I've been able to federally um, give testimony in affidavit form. Um, so those are in the courts right now. And, um, you know, you can follow up with some of that but you know our passion is to really support long term those who have been whistleblowers uh, veterans and survivors who uh, have gone against the system and you know the system for people who come out and break that silence you know really the system attacks and makes it so those people cannot get jobs so they don't have a livelihood they can't survive so our goal with illuminate the darkness.com is to help make sure that those individuals, you know, have their basic needs, that they have money for rent, they can pay their bills, they have what they need for household items. Uh, so if you'd like to make donations for that, um, you can do that at illuminatethedarkness.com. Awesome. Okay. And and like we always do, guys, we always end it in prayer. So let's let's do this. So Father God, in the name of Jesus, we appreciate everything you do, Lord. We just want to say thank you for bringing Jesse on and, um, and uh, assisting people that get blackballed like that, you know, and also ass- assisting people with spiritual warfare, Lord. Uh, we just want to rebuke all these, any, any of these uh, demons, fallen angels that are trying to maybe attach to this, this podcast, even they're probably trying to uh, mess with people's minds and brains, uh, tell them to, you know, go one way when, when, you know, they need to go towards you, Lord. So if you could please help people uh, get closer to you, Lord, uh, we appreciate everything you do for us, Lord. I, I, I just want to say thank you for giving us the tools to, for spiritual warfare, giving us the Bible, giving us the word of God, uh, which is a double-edged sword, uh, giving us the the shield of faith, uh, giving us the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, uh, the sandals of the gospel, uh, the breastplate of truth, uh, or, or I'm sorry, the, yeah, any any of the, 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 the full armor of God that we need to put on, Lord, please help everybody put that on, be ready for spiritual warfare, ready for battle. Um, we know we're getting attacked by demons, uh, tempted. I uh, just want to say I really want to rebuke all those in the name of Jesus, uh, the Leviathans, the Baals, any of these fallen angels, these nine generals. Lord, we want to rebuke them in the name of Jesus, uh, the Druidic uh, Council, the Satanic, the Kabbalah, the Masons, the any type of, uh, you know, we want to rebuke all these in the name of Jesus. We want to say, Lord, thank you for all that you do for us. We appreciate you in Jesus name. Amen. All right. Jason, thank you. Amen. Uh, Jesse, thank you. Uh, if you guys could please share the podcast and also check out Jesse's show and and all of her the three books that she has, her website, King uh Kingdom Living with Jesse.com. And also check out those courses if you want to try to get into the foundations of Kingdom Living, Rise of the Righteous, Beautifully Adorned. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening. Please share the podcast. We love you.